Good morning, and welcome to Autonomy Time. I'm Mason. I'm Miranda. I'm Robert. Today we'll be discussing close reading as our first topic. Close reading, you guys are familiar with close reading. Um, it involves annotating, rereading, um, visualization, being a really good reader. What is your opinion on that? You have to reread stuff, because if, if you only <laughs> read it once, you're not going like, to fully grasp it and whatnot. Like, even the most simple stuff, you gotta reread it a few times to like fully grasp it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think you definitely need to have a dictionary because I know there's a lot of words that I don't know, and it helps me to understand when I have a dictionary, and then I can look up the definition, and it puts it all together for me. Yeah, that's a really good point. A dictionary definitely helps when you're reading, especially a novel such as Pride and Prejudice. Um, we all took Miss Wagner's class last year, and that's a really complex book that was written in almost a different language of English. A lot of words that I had to look up because, right. you know, it's a complex book and she used tons of big vocabulary words that I had never seen before. And um, I believe with our course that we're taking now, AP Composition, we're going to really become familiar with the dictionary. We can't be using the same, like, simple words we're using in, like, like, even just last year we, we had to step it up a bit and dictionaries are always good to have handy just in just in case you find a, a better word to use instead of like a simple one. So. Right, and I know like when I read sometimes I kind of get lost, like I'll start thinking about something mm -hmm. and then I'll realize, oh wait, like I don't know what they're talking about now, so I have to go back and reread it and even then I still have to reread it again because I don't really like fully grasp it. Mm -hmm. It takes a few times. Yeah. That yeah. freaking test we took, I had, to, I had to read that thing like three times. So did I. I still didn't get it, but still. Yeah. Also visualization, that's what that leads me to. Reading, I think, helps me personally visualize a story or a passage. Um, does it help you guys? Yeah, because I feel like when you reread it and like when they use like imagery, mm -hmm. you're able to picture it better. Like, because when you reread it, you're seeing like the smaller details and then it makes a clearer picture in your head. Do you think imagery is like really important to a story? It plays a big role in a story? Well, yeah, it, yeah. it puts you in, in like their their own shoes, kind of, where you kind of see like someone describe the setting around us, like, and they use like the best words possible. I feel like I actually am there and whatnot. So yeah, yeah it really does help. What about um, a book such as um, Drive that we read this summer? Like that wasn't really like a story, but do you think he used imagery at all that like Did he? contributed? I think I can think of a few examples, but I don't know if it was really important. Go for it, because I, I honestly don't remember that much. Well, I know he talked about... Uh, I know this isn't exact, but he talked about a candle um, and a matchbox. and But he drew a picture. Or, well, I don't know if he drew the picture, but there was a picture in his book mm -hmm. of like oh, a, the candle yeah. and the wood and the match. Yeah. And it was just an example of people being able to put it together. And it was um, basically getting the reader to think about what would you do if you were given this and this amount of time to make this end result that these scientists want. And kind of give you a picture of the situation that you'd be put in. It. Yeah. Even though it wasn't really a book that's meant to have imagery, but he still used it, used it well, but yeah. yeah. Then again, like Poison Wood Bible, that one was more imagery than... Yeah, that definitely. Was, yeah, so that definitely helped with like Ukraine instead of like... Congo and when and whatnot, so yeah, it's always yeah, helpful. Yeah, it's crawling up my pants. Yeah, yeah I honestly yeah. got itchy reading that. <laughs> Our second topic is rhetoric appeals. That includes ethos, pathos, and logos. Would you guys like to go over what that means? Well, ethos is like the credibility of, let's say, an author, an informational text. So like. They have to be credible, they have to have backup, and, like, you know that they're, like, trustworthy on what they say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, like, another thing with automatic ethos, like, yeah, depending on who you are, like, say, you're the president of the United States giving a speech, just because you're the president already gives you an automatic ethos, people are going to mm -hmm. listen to you and trust you more because you're the president, and that could work for any other type of uh, situation, as long as you have some... Pathos is, like, the emotional appeal drags you in, it makes you feel how they would feel, kind of. I can see where you go with that, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Care to elaborate? Um, I would say we went over uh, George W. Bush, President George W. Bush's 9-11 uh, speech, 
I would definitely say that there was some pathos in that because he related to the American people and he used we in there. He showed that, you know, we're together in this and um, he said that I'm feeling the same thing you're feeling, basically. Right. And he talked about, he used imagery which created pathos, created emotion, and he talked about, um, you know, the planes crashing into the buildings, like he explained that and you know, as you're listening to the speech, you think about that, and you get emotional. Mm -hmm. So that's de and that definitely like grasps the audience's attention, and makes them it makes them want to listen to you. Yeah, I it think would that be the that's same. definitely important. It never would be the same. And then there's logos, right? Which is the logical appeal. Right. Any any take on that? If you're writing a novel or just a, an essay, or you're giving a speech, you need to have logic behind it you're not I mean it you're not has just to make sense some, yeah it, it needs to make sense and you're not just going to be like some random person that goes on wikipedia and changes stuff randomly right. you know <laughs> right Fifth grade I mean I, I don't know how much more to get into that do you guys nah. have another opinion on nah, it? it's kind of self-explanatory yeah you need no, logic no. or else people are going to think like you're, you're stupid <laughs> so. if you're not logical it sort of takes away like that ethos appeal because then you're not credible. Yeah, so exactly. Hey. I feel like they go, they're two and they're two. They're hand in hand. Yeah. They didn't actually think about that before. Our third topic is soapstone, which stands for... What, Mason? What stand for? <laughs> soapstone stands for speaker, occasion, audience, purpose, subject, and tone. In case you were wondering, Robert, why do you think soapstone is important? Well, I feel like soapstone is important because, well, kind of going back to close reading, you find out all this stuff in your first read, and I feel like you have to, like, pick it out. And I think soapstone is important because when you do your first read of your close reading, you have to find all this stuff in order to go back in for your second read and be able to get deeper into the text. That's what the first read's about. This is kind of, you gotta reread stuff to further understand it. Soapstone's good for that first read where you're not going to find the deeper meaning. Just kind of set the boundaries for who's, who's, who's speaking this, who are they addressing, what's the occasion, what's going on, what, what's their tone. And it just, it, it's just good to set the, the mood of that second read where you're trying to figure out the, the better understanding of the passage. Yeah, like figuring out like why the author chose, you know, that audience or that tone. Mm -hmm. um, our last topic, how we write. How do you guys think you write in general? It depends on what, what you're writing, when you're writing, who you're writing to. Like in class, like for like AP Comp, we're trying to write a bit more formal, I'm, I'm assuming, because you know, we're just, mm -hmm. that's what we're set to do. But then like if you're writing just like to write, and just, for fun, or like a diary, or just writing a story, whatever. You can write however you want. Two hours later. Like, you can write through, like, the per perspective of, of a character, or just write, like, just write how you are, how I'm talking to you right now, like, the LOLs and the OMGs, you can write, you can literally write that down, and it doesn't matter, but yeah. it all depends on who you're, yeah, who you're writing to, so AP Comp, I think it's a bit more formal and whatnot, that's what we, we, uh, we've been doing this year a lot. Do you feel confident with your formal writing yeah we need we need feedback though like, like yeah I'm, I'm i'm comfortable personally with doing like how we've been writing i just need a lot of feedback so i know what, what i'm doing wrong what i'm doing right mm -hmm. so that's why i like what we did in the murray thing how we had four drafts but but so that really helped with you know learning what we were doing wrong and, and right and helping us become better writers as we go on but i feel like some criticism does help like, I know personally, when someone just straight up tells me, like, you need to not do this, or this sounds weird, or this doesn't flow, like, it helps me. Like, yeah, yeah. you may be like, oh, okay, but, like, then you know, like, you need to fix it. Like, yeah. if someone just says, well, this isn't very fluent, so just try to work on it, like, I'm not going to take that as serious. I'm going to be like, okay, whatever. But, like, when he's yeah. like, no, this true. doesn't make sense, like, I'm going to fix it. Yeah. Well, it depends. Honestly, well, yeah, what you said is all true, but I'd... It should be a mix of both positive and negative feedback. Right. Cause like, 
you, you need negative feedback so you know what you're doing wrong. But I'd probably fo focus more on the positive feedback. So you gotta put that uh, the writer in a good mindset. Like, okay, good, I'm doing something right. I'm on track. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this paper. I'm gonna do it right. I'm gonna get better. But there's some negative feedback on the side, so I'll take that in in the counts for the my next. Right. Yeah. Like there has to be that balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's what it takes for criticism wise and becoming good writers. We need a lot of it, good and yeah. bad. And so, like, other than criticism, what do you think it takes to be a good writer? You gotta be a close reader, obviously. So, mm -hmm. and you need to have just some general idea, uh, some knowledge on the topic you're writing about, like. For the Murray essay example, we read the Murray a few times, we went over, we annotated, we talked about all the different um, literary devices he used in there and trying to put that into what we're going to be writing. So we need to know some background information, what we're writing about, how we're writing it and whatnot. So we definitely need uh, some background information to become better writers on the topic. To be a good writer, you have to be a good reader and you have to apply your good reading skills to your good writing skills. because. Mm -hmm when you're writing you have to make sure that the reader is going to understand so you have to think about when you're reading something and putting that into your writing mm -hmm. so like when you write something you have to read it and then fix it to like if you need to yeah so that they understand it and that's also why i think it's good like when we um worked on our reflective essay drafts and we brought it into class and we had our peers read it it's really good to have someone else looking at it because you, as you're in that writing process, you might really like a sentence and you're so proud of that sentence because, you know, it might be full of like really big words and it sounds really nice, but you really don't need that sentence and you need someone to come in and say, this doesn't make sense. Right. That's kind of how we, was it, was there a third draft where we just sat down and we like crossed off all the unnecessary words in there? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that helped a lot with just getting rid of stupid, irrelevant words that don't really, where they just take up space. People think, oh, big words make my my writing sound way better, but if you know what they honest, mean. yeah, if you yeah. don't know what it means and you're trying to apply it to your writing, then it it's not going to make sense and people are just going to think you're like crazy or something because, I mean, who's going to read something and not know what it means and then it not make sense when they figure out what it means? Mm -hmm. So you guys agree with like being concise? in your writing. Yeah. Of Keeping course. it simple. But also, you want it to sound good. You don't want it to be... Yeah, you don't want it to... Sorry, sorry. You don't it want is it too pretty. Simple. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you don't want simple. Like, you... you I like yeah. that. Yeah. No. Yeah, you gotta be concise. So... Hey guys, I wanted to talk to you real quick about my own personal writing style from what we have done so far. I feel like I have grown tremendously as a reader and a writer. I have a powerful and very distinct voice. My diction is advancing every, every time I write and my paragraphs are becoming more and more coherent with, with my ideas and it's just, it's just amazing and I love how much I've grown in so little time. And it's just, I love it. And I can't wait to see myself grow more and more as the year progresses on. Thanks. All right. Cool. Well, that wraps this segment of Autonomy Time. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.